thank you for joining us. I'm Wilson Stribling. Welcome to another edition of At Issue, where we discuss and debate the issues facing the state of Mississippi and how these issues impact you. MPB's political analysts, Republican Austin Barber and Democrat Brandon Jones, will join us in a moment to share their insight. But first, an update on what's happening at the state capitol. A deal has been reached to end the federal government shutdown, at least until February 15th. But if no long-term agreement is reached, it could necessitate worker furloughs in two states state agencies here in Mississippi. The welfare and child protection agencies might have to begin furloughing state employees without pay because federal welfare money has been interrupted by the shutdown. John Davis, executive director of the Mississippi Department of Human Services, told members of the House Appropriations Committee on Thursday that he needs to know by February 15th if federal money will resume. If not, Davis says he will plan for furloughs at the agency beginning in March. Jess Dickinson, executive director of Child Protection Services as his agency, which also spends money from the federal Temporary Assistance to Needy Families program, could also have to send workers home without pay at some point. Dickinson says he's waiting on, a, on $15 million in TANF funds that can be used to pay salaries. House Democrat John Hines of Washington County says as many as 7,000 state employees could be affected looking to find some ways to uh, secure them not you know, being in a situation where they'll lose their homes, their cars, uh, or be able to just to feed their families. Uh, it's unfortunate that the federal government uh, has decided uh, to uh, stop functioning in the manner it should, but it just shows you the plight of Mississippi, uh, a state like Mississippi that's depended upon a large amount of federal funds for the livelihood of their citizens. Uh, show you where we are as a state. I think we have some money in the rainy day fund that we could possibly use. You know, it's raining. And so we need to make sure that we're able to pull as much as we can, if we can pull some out. Um, um, some of my colleagues and I, we're going uh, to look at some uh, aggressive alternatives. But right now, we're just trying to figure out which what's the best solution. And uh, we've been having some conversations, and we're going to work over the weekend to probably have something in place for Monday. The Department of Human Services has not responded to emails and calls for more details. It is the third week of the 2019 legislative session and legislation that could bring faster Internet connections to more Mississippi homes and businesses in rural areas unanimously passed the Senate on Wednesday. House Bill 366, called the Mississippi Broadband Enabling Act, gives the state's 25 electric power associations the option of offering broadband Internet service. The bill now heads to Governor Phil Bryant's desk for his signature. Internet, internet. Now, we passed a bill in the Senate today. That bill will go straight to the governor for his signature. I'm confident that he will sign it. But that bill is not going to immediately solve the problem. Uh, we're going to have to continue to work on that, and technology is going to continue to change. So uh, it's a positive first step. Again, bipartisan legislation. It's not going to change everything overnight. There are rural cooperatives that will choose not to do this, uh, but it does help. The Mississippi House is advancing a bill designed to protect minors who are victims of sex trafficking. House Bill 571 would prevent charges from being filed against trafficking victims younger than 18. It would also require specialized services for youth survivors like protective custody and counseling. And it would require specialized training for law enforcement to help them recognize, identify and respond to victims of trafficking or child exploitation. Salika Corley Funches works in victims assistance at the Hines County Sheriff's Department. She's also the mother of a human trafficking survivor. Sure. Um, back in 2012, um, I had no idea what trafficking was at the time, but I got a crash course in, in what it was and what it can do to a family as well as a victim. Um, my daughter ended up missing um, for some new people that were in the area, offered her a just drink a Sprite, can of Sprite. And she said when she woke up, she was in a car full of people that she had never met in her life. What was returned to us was a totally different person. We had to deal with the mood swings, the suicides, the why did this happen to me, um, the suicide attempts, I should say, the why did this happen to me, um, dissociation, like distancing yourself away from the actual incident. So we had to deal with a lot of different, um, we had to deal with a new person. And so I had to also go to training to learn how to deal with this new person. The first probably two or three days that she was home, she slept almost the entire time. 
And so you could see the marks that were visible when I took her to get her exam. You could still see the fingerprints in her arms where she was grabbed, where she tried to run several times. And bruising here where she was snatched up quite a few times as she would try to run. So there were not just psychological scars, there were physical scars as well. I do regret that it happened. I wish that there was something I could do to change it. But, you know, now that we've learned and, <clears throat> and we've progressed and we've started to do better, I just want to educate to keep another mother from going through what my family endured as well as my daughter. Republican Representative Larry Byrd of Petal says he authored a similar bill in 2013, but this new legislation is stronger. House Bill 571 has passed the House and is awaiting action in the Senate. You know, we, we passed legislation in 2013. I happen to be the author of it. And it was a great, a great measure, great performance, had a lot of components to it. What we did was we created an enhanced penalty for trafficking a minor for sex or for forced labor when it's involving a minor. We created a, a victim's fund and we cre created forfeiture for people who are knowingly engaged in this business for profit. And so that we can reach and get assets and, and through those assets create a, a victim's fund to help people who are trapped in, in, in uh, forced labor force six. Those things we established in 13, and, and there were several components to it. We also established a uh, state human trafficking coordinator. And I understand it's been a little slow to get that up and going, but this new legislation addresses that and, and moves it to another authority. So maybe we can get something moving on that. What we lacked in 13, we're, we're making up for it today, in that uh, there was no component in there to, to require that law enforcement gets some exposure to this. Because in a traffic stop, if they don't know the right question to ask, then it just goes right by them. And this, this walks by us day after day, we don't even notice it. These individuals are, are rehearsed in what their answer is supposed to be when you ask them a question. And they're really intimidated and they're trapped. And, uh, and we need to help them, and especially the children. That's I came here with uh, a goal of helping those most vulnerable, the seniors and the children. And so this is just one of those good things you feel good about. Democratic Representative Tom Miles of Forrest sponsored a public hearing on Monday on state standardized testing. Mississippi currently requires students to take and pass the English II, Algebra, Biology, and History state standardized tests. The question on the table was whether the four tests required for graduation are the best measures of achievement or if they're more of a burden. The federal law says that our students need to be tested in some of these areas such as English, biology, and math. But the federal law does not say that they have to be used as in a punitive way for a graduation requirement. So in Mississippi what we're doing is we're putting more um, laws and more rules on our students than the federal law actually requires. And then we have high school students who say we're not prepared for college because we're spending too much time working on that test. And of course, uh, we had a little over 600 students last year who could not graduate because they had not passed one of those state tests. Um, that is horrible. <laughs> We're the one of the only states, if not the only state, that does a social studies test. And you have to have an end of subject test for social studies that if you don't pass it, you don't walk. So we need to do away with that one. The other three tests are required by the federal government. I think we could do better by doing a version of the ACT for those three tests. Some high school students and teachers at the hearing say they want to focus more on ACT prep and college readiness. They are asking lawmakers to mandate testing only in the federally required areas and that the scores not be used for graduation clearance. They want ACT scores to be used as a benchmark to grade schools on their overall academic achievement. Well, state testing has just really Every issue that we have in Mississippi schools, you can trace it back to state testing. The discipline issues, the teacher shortage, the amount of money we spend on tests that could be spent on the things that we don't have the money for. It all comes down to this huge focus on state testing. So there's got to be a change. We don't have to take away standardized testing entirely, but just make it less testing because we spend 
I think the ratings I found were we have 112 tests by the end of our senior year and that's too much and so I hope that we'll have less testing and more focus on growth as students instead of being an objective number. Jason Dean is chair of the State Board of Education. He says changing the current model can be done, but it takes a process that must align with federal requirements. Again, you know, if it's the, the legislature's will to use that as the exit exam, so be it. But I, I think that there's some pretty significant um, federal requirements that are required for peer reviewing to make sure that, you know, it's, it meets the criteria of the ESSA Act. <clears throat> and it also, uh, re uh, the ESSA Act requires that you measure not only proficiency, but growth. And so I'm not sure how the, the ACT, I'm not opposed to it, but I'm, I just, I'm, somebody needs to tell me how the ACT can show growth because I think you'd have to take it multiple years to show you know, you've, you've gained in your, your academic uh, preparedness. I'm not opposed to the ACT as being a test. I just, it has to conform with the federal law. You know, the, the, the State Board of Education uh, has been constitutionally put into place and we take an oath to uphold what the law is um, at our meetings and when the law is not uh, prescriptive enough, sometimes we make policy around the law. But our number one duty is to uphold whatever the Mississippi legislature uh, says is the law or the U.S. Department of Education says is the law and to make sure that our students are following the law. Mississippi actually receives more money from the federal government than any other state in the United States of America. So to not follow those laws puts, you know, that, that 15, 17 percent of our, our budget at risk. So um, our number one responsibility is to make sure that the law is being followed. During last year's special session, lawmakers authorized $250 million in bonds to fund emergency infrastructure repairs. This week, the Mississippi Department of Transportation determined the biggest needs in counties and cities and approved 163 projects to repair or replace crumbling roads and bridges. Things to tweak that. I think we had a great special session last year, and there's going to be billions of dollars going into infrastructure repair on top of the existing and current funds that we put into roads and bridges. So, you know, any way you look at it, there's a lot of additional money that's going to be going to roads and bridges. And as needs come available, uh, there may be more needs to tweak and look at different revenue sources. But I think so far we're off to a good start. And I want to remind people, too, now, this is just getting started. So, um, some of these things are going to have to work through the process of, of acquiring the uh, easements as necessary and getting the funds to those projects where the construction companies can start to do the work. The debate over school choice continues at the Capitol. At issue, producer Ashley Norwood was at the Capitol this week for the annual National School Choice Rally. Hundreds of advocates from across Mississippi gathered outside the state capitol asking for more alternatives to the current public school system. Some say parents should have more flexibility to take tax dollars and use them to send their children to charter schools, private schools, or seek other education options. Our political leaders have begun to create options that are not purely limited to those based on their zip code. Charter schools, dyslexia scholarships, ESAs have opened doors of opportunity to students who, whose needs would otherwise not be met. There are those in the building who do not believe we should continue to do that. We do not believe in that approach. I believe that we ought to expand the options for the children of this state. This is not about, thank you. This is not about doing what's best for the teachers or best for the employment system. This is doing about doing what's best for the children. In recent years, the legislature passed and funded legislation that gives children with special needs, including dyslexia, the option to attend public charter schools or private schools. As an educator, I went back to school and got my master's in dyslexia therapy to provide that service for my own children. And then as realizing, you know, unfortunately in most of our public schools, they, they're overcrowded. We have a lot of children in one classroom and a teacher cannot accommodate 30 plus souls in a classroom. So I knew that my children, you hear my little girl in the background, um, children need, dyslexic children and children with special needs need smaller classroom sizes. So we decided that it was best to pull them and put them in another choice um, that had smaller classroom size and that would allow me to service them with their dyslexia. Supporters of public education say school choice options take limited resources away from traditional public schools. Well, public schools is, is the uh, meat 
if you're talking about uh, educating children and uh, school choice, it has some advantages and some disadvantages. So we, it's, it's not a panacea. Uh, some people will say that it's a panacea, but it's not. We are Mississippi Association of School Superintendents, and, and certainly we're supportive of, of public schools. I know that as you uh, give parents that opportunity, uh, it takes um, resources that are really needed to educate uh, kids in public schools. It drains or, or siphons off money for those private private schools. I think we have uh, uh, great schools. I think we have, can they, can they be improved? Yes, they can. And I think everything that you, uh, uh, in any profession can be improved. Uh, and, I, and I'm not gonna say that we can't, but um, together, if everybody's working together, I think it, it, that we can get better. All right, so let's get straight to the point now with views from both sides of the aisle. Brandon Jones is a Democrat. He is an attorney with the Beria Jones Law Firm and is a former member of the House. Austin Barber is a Republican national strategist. He is the founding partner of the Clearwater Group. Good to have both of you all with us. Thank you. As Be always, here. on that issue, let's talk about the news of the day, which is the at least a temporary end to the government shutdown. Obviously, good news for the folks who haven't been paid over the past uh, two pay periods. Yeah, I think it's become a national crisis. We've seen pictures today of folks who do air traffic control work, various airports shutting down. We heard from that committee yesterday that it could have rippling effects here in state, up to 7,000 Mississippi state employees affected. So it was past time to get something done. Looks like we'll have a clean proposal, hopefully uh, run through pretty quickly. Um, I'll be curious to hear what our viewers think about the president's speech earlier this afternoon, but um, you know, it's good to be where we are to be putting that behind us and moving forward. I hope that it's sustainable. And no wall for now. For three weeks. Yeah. I mean, look, it's a three week uh, temporary agreement mm -hmm. to fund the federal government. So, I mean, the, the hope is that they'll negotiate for the next three weeks. They'll come up with a deal that something that the president and the Republicans want and something that the Democrats want and that they can all get together and, uh, and sign a deal, uh, given a little bit on each side, give a little bit of compromise to do this. I mean, because right now, nothing's really been accomplished. You had 800,000 gov federal government employees um, that were out of work for 35 days. Um, and we really, really didn't get anything accomplished. Let's just, I guess, got to be truthful here. So what I'm hopeful is in the next three weeks that the president um, can use the bully pulpit to his benefit and can talk to the American people directly to say, listen, what I want is $5.7 billion to go build what he thinks is, and what I agree, needed, um, needed a, a wall, whatever you want to call it, uh, to, to help secure the southern border. That is what his biggest thing is, and he's got to get that victory in the next three weeks. It's super important uh, in terms of just sort of the politics of this whole issue. I knew the two of you could uh, continue talking about that for at least an hour, if yeah. not more, but we want to bring it back to Mississippi. Now, let's talk about uh, the school choice uh, rally, school choice in general. This is uh, yet again another year of a very organized, well-attended rally at the Capitol, complete with, uh, I guess you could say, uniforms with the, with the yellow scarves and all. What, <laughs> what do, choice is such a, it's a, it's a wide-ranging word. What do these folks truly, truly want and why? Well, um, the, the opponents, proponents, and it's, excuse me, a school choice that you saw there. Grant Callen is the is the, the leader of that movement. And you got a lot of support, um, inner city, rural, Republicans, Democrats, uh, black, white, young and old that are supporting some, um, some facets of this program. What they're specifically asking for this year is to get more funding for these ESA accounts. And those are essentially uh, voucher accounts for a, for a parent who has a special needs child who feels like they're in a school, in their school district, that cannot uh, sufficiently meet the requirements and needs to take care of their kids. That they could use those, those funds, that voucher money, to go to a private school, a parochial school, an independent school, whatever it is, that they think can do a better job to educate and uh, get their child better prepared. There are 428 children throughout the state of Mississippi right now uh, who are benefiting that program. And I'm told that there are hundreds on a wait list who want to benefit for it. And the purpose of this rally is to ask the legislature for more funding so they can 
you know, can have more uh, scholarships essentially granted. What's wrong with that? You know, our first priority in this state should be to make sure that our public schools are funded and that we don't have issues with teacher shortages and that we have classrooms that are great for learning. And so our commitment has to remain on public school funding. Um, and that's always been the position of Democrats in the legislature, and I think it'll continue to be. Um, innovation, when it comes to education, should be invited. I mean, this is a state who has struggled to figure this thing out. And so I, I don't argue with those who want to innovate, but our first commitment has to be to funding our public schools. And without that in place, all of these other things are kind of additional things that really we're not ready for yet. I don't disagree with anything that Brandon just said, and I, he's right. We got to have the correct focus and funding on how we're supposed to do this, but there are going to be school districts who don't perform at the level that they need to, and that's what the purpose of this program is. All right, let's move on to uh, broadband internet. This is something that sort of came up, uh, I won't say out of the blue, but we, there was not a lot of talk about this last year, and suddenly it seems to be a very popular issue, at least among uh, lawmakers at the Capitol this year. Essentially, uh, companies in rural areas that have provided electricity for years have not been able to provide internet, and now there's legislation that would make that possible. Yeah, uh, these co-ops that provide uh, power and, and connectivity for people throughout the state in these rural parts are now going to be allowed to go to broadband, provide internet services. And this is a step towards modernity. It's, it, it's a step towards kind of increasing folks' quality of life and helping them to connect, take advantage of jobs and, and take advantage of communication that people are taking, let's face it, advantage of throughout the country. Um, Brandon Presley, Public Service Commissioner for the Northern District, this became a real cause for him. And I think if you notice how quickly this bill moved through the process, it shouldn't go unnoticed that this was an instance where a public service commissioner, I believe, talked to every member of that legislature, certainly talked the way through the amendment process, all the way to the passage in the Senate yesterday. He deserves uh, a lot of credit for what I think is an important step for folks who live in rural parts of our state to be better connected. Yeah, I grew up in rural Mississippi in, in Yazoo City, and certainly there are um, places in Mississippi that are in worse situations than Yazoo City is in terms of being able to have real high-speed internet. Uh, if you're a small business owner, if you are, um, you know, a, 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 Anybody who wants to try to further their education with online accreditation, online college courses, you can't do that if you're in rural Mississippi because you can't, you don't have good enough internet yeah. to be able to participate in a, you know, University of Phoenix or whoever it is that has that offers Ole Miss State, whomever that offers online courses. It is a real problem. Companies that want to come invest in Mississippi, that want to bring jobs to Mississippi they almost have to sort of ignore parts of rural Mississippi if they don't have uh, proper high-speed internet. I mean, look, yeah, they come in and they look for the qualified workforce, educated workforce, infrastructure, natural resources. Of course, they're talking to the utility companies about affordable uh, energy rates. Oh yeah, by the way, uh, do we have to use dial-up down here <laughs> or can we get some yeah. high speed internet? Those are, those are obviously extremely important issues. There, no, but there's a lot, there are certain unknowns about this bill to know how helpful it will be at the end of the day. Um, I think that the, the legislature, leadership and legislature is doing the right thing to see um, how helpful this can be. Look, if, if it, if just one EPA, if one co-op, as, as you describe them, uh, decides to go out and do this, that's a great thing. Hopefully more of them will. They're going to have to go partner with the C Spires, the AT&Ts, the real experts in this business to be able to come in and provide that technical support. So hopefully we'll have a real sort of, you know, public-private partnerships that can truly bring high-speed internet uh, to parts of rural Mississippi that thought they'd never get it. Well, it was called the Information Superhighway when it started in the early days and from uh, to actual railroads now. We now know which projects in various cities and towns are going to get funding from the special session money. Uh, what about long term? Is this, is this enough for now or, or, or where do we look long term on roads and infrastructure? I, yeah, Wilson, I, I think we all know this is not a long term solution. I, I think the people at the Capitol know. I think the proponents of this bill know it wasn't. Um, 
Republicans have a real issue right now because their base is not inclined to do funding. They, they don't want to raise rates. They don't want to raise taxes. They don't want to consider some of those things. And frankly, uh, a, a good number of Democrats over there don't either. Um, but what that means is that we've got a, an infrastructure problem that is crippling parts of our state. And we're going to continue to grapple with finding a long-term solution. Now, I'll bet, though, with the release of these projects, these hundreds of projects this week, there are folks at the local level who are excited to get that relief. Sure. Um, Austin and I talk about it all the time. There's just some nightmarish scenarios in local areas here in the metro area and throughout the state where you just can't hardly get around. That yeah. is a major problem. Yeah, so. that's a good point. You can't hardly get around. As I, um, as I drive my child to school in Jackson, it takes me, um, it's like driving on the Audubon to avoid all of the cars coming one way, the potholes. But look, this is a good first step. Um, I think it's important to go back and remember that in the special session of last year, which was in August, they passed a, a, an aggressive billion dollar infrastructure plan. Um, it takes time to get that money out uh, to the counties, to cities. Of course, most importantly, since it's state dollars, to the state highways and bridges. All right. Well, let that be the last word. Thank Austin, you. Brandon, thank you both. Thanks. And we thank you for joining us on At Issue. Don't forget, you can watch this program on our website, mpbonline.org issue. And we invite you to join us again next week for another edition of At Issue Tonight.